Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Silent Generation. Joseph and I are joined by Cone, who is a local small business owner who owns a company called Cone Ranger. Hello, hello. So he's here this week to talk to us about cowboys. But before we get into cowboys, we're going to learn a little bit about the work that he does with his brand. Uh, And we have a few questions prepared. Of course. So I first became familiar with your brand because it's in the neighborhood that I live in in Avondale. And I was walking along Milwaukee. And over the last few years, pretty much every month, I'll walk home and I'll see like a new business that's opening or about to Mm. open. And one of the ones that I did was your store. And it was actually kind of a crazy experience, though, for me, because I entered your store and I I could tell it was like a men's clothing brand, which is cool because I wear men's clothing. And I actually kind of know you (laughs) from the past, from Facebook, from the GNST, if that rings a bell. But anyways, um, I used to be on this like gay teen Facebook group back when like the only way you could meet other gay teens was like Facebook. But yeah, we were Facebook friends back in the day. (laughs) But I walked in your store and I was like, wow, there's this new small business in my area that's a men's clothing brand. And then it was someone that I knew Mm -hmm. who owned the store and it was you. Um, Not that we were ever like really friends. I never (laughs) talked to you, but that was like crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't even know if I've ever told you that. (laughs) No. I think that must be like such a powerful group. You didn't tell them that? What? what? That's that's magnificent. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like that group must be like a who's who of like accomplished like gay, not just business owners, but just like people in Chicago. Yeah. I think that's going to be a yeah. lot of like movers like, and shakers yeah, the, in the, there. The origin story. Yeah. Um, no, I know some some people in the group. Like one of them, one time I was in an LA fitness and they were playing a song that he uh, he had made. Another one of them, I was telling you a few months ago that I was on Instagram and I was looking at this video where someone was making fun of like coming home to Chicago from New York City. Oh, and he was from that? Oh, yeah, I remember that video. It was like, oh, coming yeah. back to my humble small town Chicago after being in a real yeah. city. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he was he was farming the hate clicks, you know. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. nice. I've never heard that. <laughs> yeah. Farming the hate clicks. Yeah. Bring it um, on, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like being, being gay is like being part of like a secret society where you have all these weird threads that connect you to like strange people. Like yeah. I low key, I, I text a judge pretty regularly who I'm, judge. I'm kind of like hate friends with. Like uh, <laughs> we have opposite politics and he'll like text me every time he's pissed off. Um, wow. That's actually the, it sounds like a magnificent foundation for yeah. like a, re, like a real friendship. Yeah. You, <laughs> you have know? a frenemy. You sometimes, have like a genuine sometimes frenemy. Sometimes those people are important to have in your life yeah. To, yeah. to say, you know, mm-hmm. we, yeah. But yeah, have those conversations. Yeah, there's people that I talk to that I would have no connection to if not for just hmm. being gay. Oh, um, but anyways, so that's how I got familiar yeah, with your brand. Yeah, yeah. Um, you stepped into our space. <laughs> you you saw through the window mm-hmm. kind of an idea, hopefully something that brought you in, men's clothing, um, or like the idea of men's clothing. And through that, you have come and seen many iterations of our work you've um come in and asked questions and and even donated some of your clothes um yeah. it's it's so amazing to me seeing how much our brand and our concept has grown just by making that leap to a brick and mortar yeah. studio storefront yeah. having having something that was very much our our cradled you know idea starting out of an apartment doing all of the screen printing sewing alterations in our in our bedroom and in my bedroom and in, in our living room from that to, okay, let's, let's have a, let's have a front door. Let's have an open sign and mm-hmm. let's see what, what can come from that. So yeah. when did you and your business partner start working together? So, uh, my business partner is my brother. We became an official brand, uh, September of 2020. Pretty wild. Wild yeah. time to start a brand. Yeah, let's um, do the timeline on that. Yeah. But it was it was an interesting kind of start because I even wrote this down. There were there was there's two points in where when or in which our brand kind of became. First, I would say when I was a very, very young person, I began thrifting and obsessed with vintage American wear, Western wear. Um, that was kind of like the spark that I've always kind of been chasing. Um, more focused as Cone Ranger starting 
when I moved down after college, my brother joined in. He has more of a business background. Mm. He had the ability to look at me and say, Cone, we got to get organized. If we're selling clothes, we need to be selling them. Mm. And you have all these ideas. Well, let's execute the ones right in front of you um, and in front of us and make them into a reality rather than starting all these larger mm -hmm. concepts that sounds like such a classic like story of a great successful business is yeah. the creative you know being lightly bridled by like the more business-minded yeah. acumen person yeah, and, um, and i think your story will end a lot better than the other ones because you guys are brothers is one thing <laughs> like steve jobs and steve mm -hmm. wozniak <laughs> like you know like they weren't Puma, brothers maybe Puma they and adidas them. they were brothers but oh, still, yeah still yeah. it's not it's Adolf not given Dessler and um, knock on wood yeah but oh, it is one of those things that we've even looked at each other and and said there's no way we would be able to do this without having a business partner that is as close as we are. Yeah. Because there are times when like things were really, really tough and our concept wasn't wasn't gaining any traction and mm -hmm. we had a lot of fearful thoughts and you know, there's all these pressures in 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 our own groups and in, in society of you know, you don't have a job if you're doing your own thing and you, yeah, you don't yeah, have yeah. Oh, yeah. all these all these fears. And so there was all these times where we really buckled down and, and held each other emotionally and pushed forward towards the, towards the goal. Mm -hmm. I think that has been a magnificent and positive thing and has gotten us to where we are now. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Um, so how would you describe the clothing that you create and like, who do you primarily design for? When we first opened, <clears throat> I wanted to put on the front of the shop, costume shop. By being the creative, I'm like, yeah. all clothing is costume. Yeah, the yeah, idea yeah. that we mm -hmm. can f choose what we wear each day. I want mm -hmm. people to be coming into our space and choosing what, they, what they're going to wear in mm -hmm. the future. My brother goes, you know, Cone, we're a brand new store. I think we should just say clothing. Yeah. I think we should say Cone Ranger mm -hmm. clothing. I'm like... Thankful, thankful you're yeah, here. The, Glad the, you said that. The light bridling is what I was doing. Exactly, yeah, like exactly. guiding, so you, like know? you know. I'm not trying to stamp out your creative big, vision. Big I'm trying to direct let's, you in a good direction. Let's dial it in. Yeah. And so how I would describe our clothing is in two parts. We've got our street style portion of our brand. That's where we bring in graphic tees. These are all new garments, hoodies, work shirts, trucker hats, bucket hats, items that are brand new, some manufactured, some altered by us. That's one side of our brand. We do lean toward towards more of a masculine um, silhouette. That's for now. Um, that's just, mm -hmm. I feel out of comfort for ourselves, designing pieces that we interact with heavily. And then the second half, which I find the most exciting is when we upcycle garments. Mm -hmm. So that's when we heavily curate vintage from all over the country and from all different time periods, but we definitely lean towards workwear, durable cotton denim, and we have even kind of marched into more blazers and traditional Tailoring. men's and yeah, men's oh, workwear, now you're speaking my uh, business wear, workwear in another, in yeah. another form. Mm -hmm. So I enjoy taking the structure of an item like a flannel or a pair of jeans and manipulating it in all sorts of ways, adding, subtracting, um, all sorts of alterations that we do at our shop to create one of a kind garments. Yeah. It's really fun and fresh to be able to crank out items that you know are the only one of their kind mm -hmm. and are reusing and repurposing items that have already been manufactured. Yeah, I think those are two really good like selling points. Definitely, like that's two things that people like value now, and I think they should value all the time. But those seem especially like of the moment. Yeah. I think the excitement of items like that, it is growing, and yeah. it's there are more and more people that are mm -hmm. seeking those types of things out, and yeah. we felt it in the three years of four years of business mm -hmm. um, that it's something that is is hopefully on the cusp. Yeah. And then, so what clothing brands or designers are you like mainly drawing inspiration from? Because I, we operate in, in, a, in a vintage space, but also hopefully a future space, mm -hmm. um, I, look up t I look up to designers such as Virgil, Matthew yeah. Williams, Heron Preston, Tom Bogo, Kid Super, those leading names mm -hmm. in street style. 
while also looking back to vintage Levi's, Wrangler, mm -hmm. Carhartt, Ralph Lauren has had incredible yeah. um, silhouettes for an, uh, for a really long time, and no, that's in terms good, of yeah. American workwear, and yeah. we'll even bringing kind that. of more military and uh, military cuts and aesthetics into high fashion. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Did, did you ever see the Virgil Abloh exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art? Changed my life. Yeah. I saw it too. Hey. I was working there when that happened, actually. Wow. Um, as well as my younger sister. I got her a job there for the summer. Um, Family business. <laughs> Maybe I walked past you, Nathan, all those years ago. It's possible. We've had a few. It's possible. Possible actually, crossings. Yeah. Um, someone I talk to every single day of my life, literally. There's this guy in Brazil. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but the story might be a bit too long, but there's someone where when I was working at the MCA, he texted a guy and knew that there was a cute guy at the MCA. And then my <laughs> friend, my friend of this friend was like, Oh wait, I know someone who works there. Is it this guy? And he showed the Brazilian guy a picture of me. I mean, he was like, yeah, that is. And so wow. we got connected and we talk like every day, That's such a but wild. yeah, I might've seen you too. Yeah. Um, I yeah, said, well, less memorable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I was there. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't pretty enough to be remembered. But yeah, um, but yeah, the, the, the Virgil Abloh exhibition at the MCA. They were like planning like years in advance, and they mm -hmm. were having like all staff meetings, like every week, being like, "This is going to be so big, and yeah. we're going to have like all these people." And it was like it was wild. Like at one point, they gave like all of the security guards free. Virgil Abloh shoes. They gave <laughs> every staff member like Virgil Abloh shirts. And um, yeah, it was a wild time. I felt when I was seeing it, I was like, freaked me out a little bit because it, 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 to me, clued or provided a, some small clue that like he wasn't going to be around for much longer. Oh, like, it, he, it, like it everyone's was, given a finite amount of creative output. And well, it's and, like, and, and the where way do you go after it was this? framed felt like, yeah, it felt like it was like retrospective. Not too much. They weren't, it wasn't like, okay, these are the next few things that he's working on. It was kind of like this, this Louis Vuitton bag was like the beginning of Louis yeah. Vuitton and then where he's going. And, mm. and obviously that's an exciting thing as a designer to start from printing on your own blanks to yeah. designing the Yeezus album cover to, mm -hmm. you know, making a Louis Vuitton bag and, and Nike shoes. But I did, I do remember seeing it and being like, why is this happening now? Like, why is this <laughs> happening now? Yeah. yeah. yeah his, his, his career is just beginning in my eyes. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, fine arts museums, they occasionally dip their toes in the water of popular culture mm -hmm. in order to like generate buzz. Like mm -hmm. the MCA many years ago, they had like a David Bowie show that I refused to go to. I, I went to it for six months. It was amazing. I waited for it to be put down until I went back. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was like a Bjork show at MoMA in New York mm -hmm. that like people were pissed about. But yeah, Virgil Abloh, I mean, fashion does get exhibited in contemporary and modern museums all the time. But like it was kind of like uh, he was he was famous in, in, a, in a creative enough way that he was allowed to be exhibited in a museum like the MCA. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's why they did it. They didn't know he was going to die. That was complete coincidence. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, also on Levi's for the Men in Uniform episode that we just did recently, I learned that like the main innovation of uh, blue jeans was actually the rivets that go into mm -hmm. the jeans, mm. which you'd think it was just like the color of the material. Yeah. yeah. But like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you like working with rivets? Love, I have a love-hate relationship with the rivets, <laughs> um, but I love working with denim. I love the There's tradition of, mm -hmm. of denim. The the fact or the the idea that the more it gets worked in, the more it shapes mm -hmm. to your body. It's kind of similar to leather wear, the yeah. similar concept Pattern of, enough. of yeah, yeah it, it becoming worn and and building a patina is, is a positive thing. Mm -hmm. And so when you're taking vintage items and you're upcycling them, which is an, a phrase that lots of times people come into the shop and don't understand what I mean when I'm saying I'm upcycling. Yeah, it makes uh, sense. Yeah. It it makes we sense. use it in construction it's, all the time. It's correct. like, yeah, it's, um, yeah. But it's... it's uh, it's a fabric that holds its value very well and has had a very permanent staple in American clothing design. And, and I think it will go down in yeah. history. It's like the most American thing. It always gets brought up like, you know, apple pie, blue jeans, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, and it, it, it's representative of like American, um, 
I don't know, the working spirit of mm-hmm. it, entrepreneurial kind of thing. It taps into a lot of stuff. Effortless American cool. Like it touches every part. Who's the designer who said like, God, I wish I could have thought of blue jeans. Who was that? It was like, I have only one regret in my life and that's not inventing blue jeans. I actually, one of the, I don't own a pair of blue jeans. Uh, it's such a weird trait of mine. Like, I don't know. I only wear like chinos and corduroys and wool slacks and then linen in um like summer. But I've like gearing myself up to like, Someday I'll see it. Yeah, I'll see a it. pair of blue jeans. It's all about in cut. The, like, it, it is all about cut. I owned a pair of wheat Wrangler jeans with cowboy cut, mm-hmm. um, but they didn't really like fit me right. I don't know. It was like too loose in the waist and too tight in the thighs. Um, but I was like, no, there has to be something else. Like I just, it just wasn't this one. Like yep. I'll find another yep. cowboy cut jean that that's, I like. That's the thing that I think a lot of people shy away from jeans because one, they've had bad experiences with them, not fitting mm-hmm. or growing out or you toss them in the dryer and they get screwed. Mm-hmm. But also, um, when you're trying on jeans, they're going to feel like a brand new, brand new pair of shoes. You need yeah. to break them into your body and, and stretch them to your shape. And that's that's something that I think a lot of people don't realize when they buy new jeans. And they definitely feel it when you're finding vintage or thrifted mm-hmm. or upcycled denim. Yeah. I had yeah. been like a, I'd own a, owned a pair of raw denim jeans that I eventually kind of grew out of. Um, and I like, I definitely got it then, but that was... I don't know. That was during like the high water mark of like everyone being so into raw denim jeans. Mm-hmm. I forget what company mine were from. But yeah, it was fun to build. I would, I, this was in my fraternity and we had pledge books. So we had these little books that we'd have to carry on us at all times and that wore a certain pattern in my back pocket. So like even after I wasn't a pledge anymore, I still had that mark in my jeans. I thought that was cool. Didn't matter because I'm just not a 32 waist anymore. So I don't get to wear them. But yeah. I bet people would think that. That was made by like a pocket Bible or something. Yes, mm-hmm. uh-huh. that's the vibe I try. My about. ledger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's one more question I want to ask you about your company before we get into things. But you'll bring up your brand many times throughout the mm-hmm. episode. But like, what was your reason for picking Avondale when you were setting up your shop? Um, it was a wonderful, wonderful accident. I guess not an accident, but uh, we trusted a professional. We were doing a lot of things on our own before we reached out to this realtor. We were looking for spaces on our own and, and didn't really know what and where and when. We did a, a, a short pop-up at this place called West Town Chamber of Commerce. They have a, uh, hmm. they have a, make, a pop-up project. So we rented a, that 500-square-foot little showroom out for three months. It was an amazing opportunity for us to step out of our studio and make a studio storefront for the first time, sell directly to a customer, explain our concept over and over again, experience the the social effort it takes to be a clothing designer and also a salesman and also the brand. So we tried that out and we were like, okay, it's working. We're getting, we're making better sales. We are more consistent with what we're making. Let's make the leap to a, to a, a lease. So while we were in this pop-up project, our realtor was looking around, asking all of her coworkers, asking where the best place to be is. And she goes, there's this neighborhood called Avondale. It's a little bit north of Logan Square. It's right on Milwaukee Avenue. I think you should go check it out. And we have these videos of us walking through the space and it's, it's an unfinished building. White box space. Not even white box Uh, yet. (laughs) Worse than white box. And we're looking around and we're like, Okay. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I mean, we'll sign the lease when, when the walls are up, but like put yeah. us on the list, but that's how we found Avondale. So from that moment, we became a part of Avondale and the neighborhood. And we have spent five days a week, every week since we opened up operating at our storefront in Avondale. And it's been magnificent to see lots of other small businesses open slash stay open Lots of vintage, lots of repurposed items, lots of community building just in the store owners and the clerks. And um, it's been magnificent to see and to be a part of. It really has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the Milwaukee Corridor is such a good choice. Like things are pretty dense along there. And it's like other parts of the northwest side can get pretty sleepy. You get a lot of like Burger Kings and strip malls and Mm -hmm. stuff once you stray from that corridor. But like... I know, I was just walking along it and the buildings like Chicago is known for its alleys, but on like major streets, buildings just go right tight to each other. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's like this 
pretty steady kind of flow of new information as you walk down that street of just like, I don't know, bustling stores and stuff. And it's, things are decently high rise, like things around three or four stories mm-hmm. around there. Yeah, it seems like a logical step. You can just kind of follow Milwaukee up and it always stays pretty lively. Yeah. And I've lived in Avondale for like eight years. And the building that you were in, I can envision it when you first saw the space because they were working on it for a long time. And it was like, it's such a random building. It's like clearly very old, but the amount of work they've done on it, like from the outside of it, you'll look at it and you'll be like, what did they do? It feels like they kind of like, they took out like a section of the top floor and the, it's, it looks so bizarre. But yeah, they were working on that for like a long, long time, but it looks cool now. And there's like this wine bar next door that just opened that's really pretty Mm -hmm. yeah i don't drink but it looks cool they have they do some i think they had some na wines that they were working on for january but yeah it's honestly worth just popping in and talking to the owner dave i don't know much about wine i i am more of a a a beer cocktail kind of guy but it's so much fun to walk in and ask him and and kind of allow yourself to be a novice and yeah. say I don't I don't know mm-hmm. and I would love for you to share what how why yeah. and when. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I always try and defer on that stuff. I don't try and like build up any like it's, any wine knowledge. Like when I'm like taking a girl on a date to uh-huh. somewhere, like I have no shame about saying like house Chardonnay, I mean, like house whatever. Like you know, it's uh, it's hard to do sometimes to admit you don't know something, mm-hmm. but once you do, you realize that lots of times people want to teach you. Yeah, and yeah. and, and mm-hmm. if you're willing to learn, and by making that step by saying I'm not sure, it opens the door for people to teach you. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. So for our next section, we're going to talk about like individual garments that make up the outfit of a cowboy. And then we'll get into more like meta stuff. We'll go thick into just like the idea of the cowboy in the West. But let me see it's for us on the list. The most but, iconic piece yeah. of a cowboy's but, uniform. Yeah. yeah. The first thing on the list is um, the cowboy hat. So we'll talk about like the function mm-hmm. and the form of the various garments. Um, so to start cone what is the function of a cowboy hat in its most basic term or most basic form blocking sun temperature control and honestly it distinguishes you as someone that owns land there are multiple i don't i don't know the exact distinctions but there are elements of a stetson cowboy hat that you impress or depress to create a shape on the top of your hat. And you have to have a certain amount of acreage to have a certain type of hat. So there's all these, these things. Yeah. Yeah. And oftentimes cowboy hats are made from either straw or hide. So the idea of, of shaping cow hide uh, into a shape of a, of a cowboy hat is like, using what is around you while also it is the livelihood of the cowboy. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of forms a, a, a Western crown almost of, mm-hmm. of. Yeah. And I read online that they're primarily made out of like straw or felt. Mm-hmm. Felt and hide are the same thing in this or not really. They, there are felt hats and then you can also, I believe you can have, uh, they do leather hats. So mm-hmm. you can have uh, steam slash heat set. Leather. I bet those yeah. ones are less comfortable. I wouldn't. I don't think I'd want to wear that. I'm sure yeah. it's one of those things where it's a seasonal piece, and also yeah. like denim or cowboy boots or pieces of leather, leather gloves. The more you wear them, the more you break them in, the more you interact with them, yeah. use them for what they're designed for, mm-hmm. riding. Um, the more comfortable they're gonna feel. Yeah. Yeah. I um I was picking my grandparents' brains on like hats before they went away because my grandparents you know born in the late 30s and so they saw the last kind of like gasp of hats in 50s and 60s and they had said with the kind of folding the top of the hat two men could own the exact same hat which was common like there was kind of a there was a a few monopolies on hats but they would crease them in a different way that you could like if they set them down you could always tell what was yours which I think is really cool Um, yeah I think that plays along with with Less having less items, which makes you interact with the one the items you have more. Mm-hmm. So like a trusty hat. A trusty your hat. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna. Yeah. I like any kind of 
like outfit constants. That's why I like watches so much because I only I have a million things that I wear and I have two watches, and so they feel like so close to me. Mm-hmm. Um, rings too, yeah. as well. You can wear those anything. And and on the shape of the hat, apparently, the crown can have impressions that like indicate if like a person is like a bull rider, oh. <laughs> things like that too. Yeah. But the shape of the brim is just purely aesthetic, from what I was reading. It can be like curved, and I think it looks better curved. The ones that look that have, have no form to them. I don't know. They just look, they remind me of these hats that they used to sell at, Amer- at American Apparel called like the floppy hats <laughs> that were felt and very cheap. I, I don't like the look of those ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, utilitarian, yeah. more um, fast fashion. In yeah. Australia, like their cowboy hat is like the slouch hat where one side of it is pinned up against the side. And that was said, if you're carrying a rifle on your back, it doesn't like hit the brim. Uh, repeatedly so i think those are a good look i don't know i like it i like most asymmetrical things and, I'd and say. that's that's also an example of form being altered for function yeah so taking an item that a lot of military uniforms of you can see especially in vietnam a lot of alterations to yeah. military uniforms because of setting and also you know a little bit of an anti-establishment yeah, we had talked yeah, in movement. the men in uniform that like, yeah, military men always like look for ways to like, differentiate themselves because the idea of the military is to like break you down into these identical units. But mm-hmm. people are always going to like, you know, show their individualness through tattoos and stuff, but also by like, yeah, you know, custom etched Zippo lighters or mm-hmm. such a treasured like item from the Vietnam, like, you know, the culture of men being at war in Vietnam. And then, yeah, just like customizing your helmet and things like that. Or your hat. Yeah. yeah. Feathers in your cap. Yeah. Yeah. The next garment that we're going to explore are bandanas. So the function of these, I had no idea. You know, I actually, I've seen many cowboys where they'll have like a bandana on their necks. I've never really thought about it, but apparently it's to like protect from the sun. So your neck doesn't get sunburned because the hat with its wide brim would cover your face, but the front of your neck was like at risk of sun exposure. But it could also be like taken off and used for like, to protect from like dust inhalation. And yeah, I never realized how functional it is. And you actually came here with a bandana. Oh, yeah. I pretty much always have one. What do you use it for? Everything. Mm-hmm. Um, mostly a, a, a scarf. I, I wrote down here, it's like the toughest scarf you can have. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I would always try not to wear a scarf in construction. I was just like, ah, men don't wear yeah, scarves. You know, like I'll wear like a neck gaiter instead uh-huh. sometimes, yeah. but I've given up, I just wear the scarf. Yeah. What's a neck gaiter? It's like a just tube. T- of material like if people would wear them in COVID, it's like one of those neck braces that you wear. (laughs) Virginia George. Mm -hmm. Um, no. So I, there, I love the bandana. It's like a magnificent, another trope of the cowboy and it's, it's a piece of Americana, but it also is a utilitarian object. There was a outdoorsman called Cody Lundin and he always said that a scarf is like a tool. Um, you can use it to collect wood. You can use it to blow your nose. You can use it to make a flag. You can use it for. You can use it to filter. You it. The opportunities are endless. As a clothing designer, it's an accessory that can add flair, color, visual interest, and then even further in the gay community, it was used as a way to flag your, for your prospects what you were interested in. Mm-hmm. It's been a piece of. American folklore for such a long time. And I, I remember as a, as a young, young kid dressing up as a cowboy, I would wear the bandana over the nose. Like you see mm-hmm. the, the robbers in the movie and yeah. mm-hmm. the outlaw. However, when I was getting older, I spent a little bit of time, a very, very small amount of time with my uncle who had a ranch in South Dakota. We we're riding around on horseback over large expanses of field, checking in on cattle. And you realize that one, you need something to cover your neck. And two, oftentimes during the end of the summer when it's dry and dusty and you're flipping things over and moving hay bales, that you need something to cover your face. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. A mask to cut back the amount of debris that you're breathing and and hitting you in the face. So it it being not only an accessory, but also a tool is... Is something that I've heard then discovered. Yeah. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I learned through this week's research is that the most common pattern that you see on bandanas is called the 
bad Nadia pattern and it comes from Kashmir. But that information actually wasn't that easy to like come across. But you wrote something interesting in the docket. About yeah, that. it's uh, like the history of we think of like, oh, these are American cowboy garments. And so they must have all been made from American materials, like manufactured the textiles themselves and then sewn in America. And really just that last step probably would have been in America. Like the cotton trade was, I mean, global shipping is very cheap, even back in the olden days. Like it was much cheaper than anything over land. So like it was economically feasible to get textiles from yeah India. So I don't know. The... Word origins of clothes always really fascinates me. I mean, denim is from like denims in France. So even this American thing is mm-hmm. very French in some way. Gingham might be from uh, the Malay word gang gang. Uh, it just sounds like saying gang gang. But yeah, it could also be guin comp in uh, France. Um, and then madras or madras is a very like preppy fabric, especially like patchwork madras. I have one of those and that's a region in India. So like, yeah, we globalization has always existed to one degree or another, but like global trade has just always been like a need. And even it's just so funny to think about these like cowboys with a very like provincial worldview, you know, or like town people who are wearing these garments all the way from India. Yeah. And they're complex both in the aesthetics and how those distribute across place and time, but also the supply chains are so complex and they wrap up all corners of the world. Mm -hmm. And one thing I learned over the last year that was really fascinating was that like, Cotton has to be grown basically in a desert, but needs like a ton of water. So it grows in some of the most like random places that you can mm-hmm. think of. But one place where that like makes a lot of sense is in Egypt, where, mm-hmm. you know, they're right next to the Nile. Mm-hmm. That's Egyptian why there's cotton, a lot of Egyptian yeah. cotton. Turkish cotton towels too. There oh yeah, go. that too. Um, it also caused the draining of the Aral Sea though, oh. um, which was at one point the world's fourth largest lake. Oh, um, but they, the Soviet Union, it's now like, significantly smaller it's like less than 10 percent of the size that it once was because they used up all the water growing cotton um Mm -hmm. but yeah would one of you want to do the next one which is western shirts or like i think you're wearing the better western shirt so you can start snap some open (laughs) um reading this so western shirts Oftentimes, when I would think of a Western shirt, you imagine what you've seen in, or what I've seen in movies, or even at rodeos, which you're going to have the wildest, loudest prints, mm-hmm. large, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, excessive collars, and it's not always the case when you're you're working on a ranch, and that kind of goes back to what we were talking, or what I was reading about earlier about having idea of it being a uniform utilitarian purpose or a costume. And I think that oftentimes when I think about Western shirts, I'm imagining more the costume of the cowboy. And in most recent history, we've seen a lot of people wearing Western wear yeah. and em- embellishments with buttons, button uh, pearl snaps and large two front pockets with snaps but reading what you had written down here about it being a utilitarian purpose to not only rip, not rip your shirt if you get caught on something, getting off a horse or moving a, a fence post around, that was something that I had never heard of. I didn't, I didn't know that at all. No, I didn't yeah. know that either. But, it make, but after learning it, it makes a ton of sense. Mm-hmm. If you want your garment to be more durable allow it to break when it needs to. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I think it also like keeps you safer. Like you don't want to get dragged. I can imagine situations where like a real cowboy, like mm-hmm. if their shirt did not rip off, they could get seriously hurt or killed. So yeah, that's always like a counterintuitive part of safety of like, you don't want to make everything super strong. And so you're like, Oh, you need things to like break in the right way. It's like crumple zones. You know, the goal yeah. of a car should not be like that. It's this, like everyone always talks about, oh, cars in the 50s and you could crash in that thing and then just bend it right back and it was good. And it's like, yeah, but you're dead. <laughs> like yeah. if you crashed in that, <laughs> you've flown through the window someone because you had... Yeah, it yeah, exactly. It can live on. Yeah, I'm wearing a Western-esque shirt. Uh, this is... I have like a chamois. Is that how you I say would that? not look at that and think it's Western. I, yeah, it's... So like chamois shirts, it's like made of cotton. Uh, it does have two front pockets. Chamois um, is not a very uh, mask word. It is not. No, there's not a good way. Uh, my chamois shirt. Like, <laughs> or chamois, I guess some people end up pronouncing it like that. This one's by some company called Fieldmaster, made in the USA. Nice. Bought it off eBay, where I buy everything. And L.L. Bean like invented cham- chamois shirts in the 20s as an alternative to buckskin, apparently. Yeah. 
But yeah, I like front pockets a lot. I like use them on the construction site. Sometimes for AirPods, but also I carry a variety of like carpenter pencil, Sharpie, actual pen. And then sometimes I'll put like a pen on one of those extendo things actually yeah. <laughs> uh, for, I don't know, marking stuff on drywall. I but, never really used pockets with shirts because I always use my front pockets, which I know like a lot of guys just use their back pockets for some reason. Mm-hmm. Like um, some people think it's like weird to put your wallet in the front. I, that's, I'm not like no, that. No, yeah. The whole like having a giant wallet and putting your back pocket is like, that's so bad for it's, your hip alignment. I know, but yeah. I feel like that's probably, I've obviously not looked at the statistics on this. It's such a random thing but like i wouldn't i feel like the average american probably does just put it in the back mm-hmm. um but yeah i don't know my front pockets have always been good enough for me i also feel that if let's imagine we're on horseback and we're we're doing a a, a cattle drive drive you know we're yeah. bringing them from mississippi mm-hmm. out to california and you're riding your horse and you need to take a field note Something happened, so you're not going to be reaching in your back pocket if you're riding a horse. You're probably not going to have anything oh, in your back yeah, pockets yeah. if you're riding a horse. Yeah. You're not going to be able to reach in your front two pockets. Being able to access your tools that you need mm-hmm. up on your chest is like a pretty important piece yeah. for a contractor, yeah. for sense. a cowboy, yeah. for oh, yeah, a, a working class, working person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was always jealous of my dad's like Air Force flight suit because they have these pockets on their lower leg which is very accessible when you're like crammed into a, uh, a cockpit but yeah you can just like reach down and grab something very easily um, i like that like dickie's work pants will have that fifth pocket mm-hmm. sometimes that i get very used to um yeah chest pockets big fan in the kind of more like trad dressing style ivy stuff there's a few quirks with pockets brooks brothers likes to not put pockets on them so i don't like that j press Big fan of them. They have a flat pocket, which I think is good because I'm often like bending over for something. And I don't want things falling out. I heard from someone from Sweden that uh, chest pockets are called bus driver pockets and they're seen as very like day class A and not like fancy, basically. And I'm like, yeah. Man. <laughs> I don't know why they're throwing bus drivers under the bus um, in that sense. But yeah, it's it's yeah. it is a, it's utilitarian. And that is like a rough rule. Mm-hmm. And anything fashion wise yeah. is that like, you know, at the highest level of black and white tie, it's very like cumbersome and like not useful garments but that's why it's formal Mm -hmm. yeah so the fourth garment we'll talk about we're moving you know from top to bottom now we're hitting the legs so we're going to talk about chaps okay so these have like more of a function than i thought they did just because they've been so like sexualized (laughs) i was gonna say Uh, yeah the cowboys weren't wearing them for funsies i know (laughs) i actually for me actually i um i'm used to seeing chaps in the context of like metalworking because Mm. I uh, went to art school and I never worked in the foundry, but like in the foundry you would wear chaps or they would wear chaps. But yeah, it makes sense why they, okay. So what they're for is that they protect the wearer from thorny vegetation, like cactuses, which makes sense why the inner thighs aren't covered. Cause like, you know, you're not going to run your crotch into a cactus Mm -hmm. unless you are jumping on it. Um, (laughs) But yeah, I didn't realize they had as much of a function as they do, but I guess it just wasn't, okay, whatever. Yeah, yeah. they're, they're, it's, chaps are a fascinating thing because they have been so sexualized. And so the idea of <clears throat> chaps being assless, we have a pair of chaps <laughs> in the shop. Every other person that comes in, it's about 50% of the time they see the chaps and they can say, assless chaps. Assless chaps. chaps are by definition assless. 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 Yeah. They're all assless chaps. All chaps yeah. are assless because you're intended to wear them over a pair of jeans. So it's a, an added layer. I see them as kind of like a double knee pair of yeah. Carhartt pants. You know, they sew the chaps in. But the idea of having extra coverage for rough bushwhacking when you're on horseback Along with lots of times in rodeos when there's a lot of rope, you yeah. need chaps. It's also a style piece when you're uh, riding bulls to yeah. have that flair. I didn't know that about the fringe being an opportunity or a way to pull water off of the stitch. Yeah, that's something I wrote in the docket. Honestly, it's crazy. I mean, it's not that crazy, mm-hmm. but like you think about cowboys all day. Like all this stuff, like I didn't know it, you didn't know it. Yeah. Like, but when I read that stuff about like the fringe, something about it felt like Jurassic. 
I don't know. Just like <laughs> it, it needs felt, to wick like water away from its body. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't, I don't know. That to me, it was just like thinking about each element of a cowboy's outfit. It's mm-hmm. like, wow, they're like really just like enmeshed in their terrain. And it felt like mm-hmm. engineered. Yeah. In a yeah. way that like. But no, evolution is like Jurassic and evolution is a good way to think about it. Like, I'm sure when people first went out to the West, they were dressed as like, you know, this is early 1800s. So like we're closer to colonial settlement, kind of like breaches and stuff yeah, like wool. that. And then it's like progressively like they are adapting to it. And wool, I mean, wool does have purposes, but I'm sure mm-hmm. like not in the, yeah. you know, the thick of summer out West. I remember seeing there's like guys online who do like outdoor backpacking stuff but they do like cowboy backpacking and they wear the real get-ups and everyone's like oh that must be so like inefficient and these guys whole video is like no it's not like they were on to something like what? yeah some things like you know Gore-Tex rain repellent stuff like yeah the cowboys would have loved that if they mm-hmm. had it but there is like there's something to this stuff guys weren't going out there and dying <laughs> like yeah. well I mean they were like yeah, other things that. but like not immediately because of their clothing yeah it's a lot of the the Clothing has evolved, like you said, mm-hmm. and I think it was also part of what they had access to. So a lot of using a lot of the the hides and using mm-hmm. learning from the people that came before us in in those spaces and and mm-hmm. saying, okay, let's use, let's make pants out of leather um, as a way to protect ourselves. And also waxed canvas was another thing that before plastic was introduced into a lot of outdoor mm-hmm. gear. <clears throat> oftentimes waxed canvas was a way that you could put panels on shoulders to allow water to run off. Mm-hmm. Um, but there, there were things that, like you said, it wasn't, it was brutal to live out and to, to drive cattle and to, to be a cowboy. I think it's oftentimes very romanticized, but they were suited. All of their garments were suited for function. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think that they've remained in such I rapport in terms of designers and, and silhouettes and mm-hmm. cuts because it's when things are designed well and used well, they can last. And mm-hmm. I think that is why we still love cowboy boots in, in fashion. We all gravitate yeah. towards blue jeans, denim and, and, and pearl snaps. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Cowboy it, boots. It repeats. It repeats. You, pour, you but, wore, no, let him introduce yeah. it. You don't have to do that. Hey, an introduction for... No, yeah. for the last element of the, of the oh, outfit. Oh, oh. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, 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 you're good, you're good. Um, <laughs> I was going to do a natural segue. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> oh, I don't believe that you can dress as a cowboy without the proper pair of boots. Yeah. Um, and I say dress as a cowboy because the idea of a cowboy is very large, right? We all want to be, well, I have always wanted to be a cowboy. But as I grew up and grew in my knowledge of, of, you know, what a cowboy's life really looked like, I realized that I was more inspired by the, um, the, the idea of cowboys and the idea that has been portrayed through movies and through um, stories. As I grew older, I realized that, okay, you know, you can still have these elements that make up a cowboy's wardrobe, um, but bringing them into a more contemporary space is, is kind of, in my mind, a little more exciting than, yeah. um, than living out on a ranch. So with that, I have had a pair of cowboy boots in my possession since I was three years old. Grew out of many pairs that I still have, but it is, a like I said, an essential part of the cowboy aesthetic, the cowboy look, and that is the boot. There are a few different types of boots. There are um, low heel cowboy boots oftentimes sometimes now made with rubber so that's more of a work boot the square toe that's more traditionally right now what a lot of cowboys or western workers would wear a lot of iron workers a lot of steel workers will will wear square toed cowboy boots and then the pointed high heel cowboy boot is a riding boot so that's designed to click into your stirrup Mm -hmm. allow support while you're riding not the most comfortable to walk around in until you've broken them in, even when they're broken in. Walking on concrete is not exactly what they're designed for. But I always kind of am excited when I'm wearing cowboy boots because one, they fall really, jeans fall really nicely on top of them, no matter Mm -hmm. what kind of jeans you're wearing, unless they're too tight. But also the sound they make when they're walking. Mm. I love sound. And the, the feeling of the, the sound as you walk makes people think 
that it's high heels that are yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think a woman's it's, coming. Yeah, yeah it's an amazing thing. You're at the grocery store and in the heel they're on the tile floor as you're hitting your heels, people will turn around expecting someone in, in presumably a woman in high heels and it's me, six four <laughs> cowboy look alike, you know, looking yeah. for, you know, something That's to eat. But it's, yeah, subvert expectations. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that yeah. something that I've really enjoyed in my design process is subverting um, this idea of the cowboy and bringing it into not only a more contemporary street style space, but also a queer space and a reimagined aesthetic because I have seen and know the cowboy aesthetic and it's, it's been mm-hmm. done, but mm-hmm. bringing pieces and parts from that aesthetic into what, how, and why we design things now or redesign pieces is, is really what excites me. Yeah. I yeah. think yeah, every generation is going to like rediscover the cowboy in some new way. Um, not to like try and sum up your approach to the cowboy, but I think like you bring, I would say like a streetwear sensibility to, you know, Western wear into the cowboy aesthetic, which is, I don't know. I can't think of anyone who's done that um, too much, but yeah, there's always going to be a new angle for it. It speaks to like something in the deep yeah. American consciousness. Are there any other cowboy esque brands that you feel like a kinship with? Yes. Um, Wrangler, obviously. Yeah. Um, but you might want to say, cause they're a competition. Right? <laughs> yeah. But that's, what's so exciting about where we're at. We, 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 are a design group. My brother and I are a design group and we are small but mighty in that we bring a lot of ideas, a lot of concept. But while Wrangler may be, you know, future competition, I would like to see them as an opportunity to collaborate. Yeah. And mm-hmm. some some companies like that have such a strong sense of brand and sense of product that it almost allows us as the, the new wave of designers mm-hmm. or, or cowboy con- con- uh, conceptual thinkers, uh, we can take an item like a pair of jeans or a jean jacket and reimagine it in our lens. So while, yes, they are yeah. I, our competition, it is one thing that I, I think that, that a brand that would align very nicely with us. There's also a brand called Justin Boots, Make incredible cowboy boots. Yeah. Um, I've had a few pair of theirs. Um, and then in, in a more Chicago space, um, Ancala's is a, a Western wear store on Chicago I've Avenue. I've always wanted to go into there. It's amazing. I'm afraid. If to. you're listening now, <laughs> it, it may seem afraid. You, yeah. It may seem kind of scary from the outside. I am a gringo. Or, I am like yeah. dressed in an Oxford cloth button down. I don't, I don't know if I can go into Alcala's, but that's I the, can. I can. That's the thing. They uh, have, I think, something for everyone. And uh, it's another small owned business, it's a family business. And when you walk in, they are there to help you find the jeans you're looking for, the boot, the belt buckle, the hat, whatever you, the pocket knife, whatever you're looking for, they can kind of steer you in the right direction. And um, it's really exciting to see another small family owned business doing so well and selling something that we kind of align with as well. So if you're yeah. listening to this, go, go stop in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So we've explored all the individual elements of a cowboy's outfit. And now we're going to be able to talk about cowboys and Western culture and the idea of the West from like a more top level view. And so for this week in preparation, I reread this article that I read many years ago for a class. I think it was like an English class. And It's not a well-known or widely published article, but it's really fascinating. It's called The Cultural Myth of the Cowboy or How the West Was Won by Jennifer Moskowitz. And it explores the idea of the cowboy by first like looking at how knights became mythologized in England after the feudal system collapsed. The main claim that Moskowitz makes in the article is the archetypes were both essential ideological and hegemonic elements in England and America's paradigmatic cultural shifts as the countries moved towards nationalism, industrialism, and capitalism. And so basically, I think what she claims about knights is a bit less important. I mean, particularly for this episode, it's Mm -hmm. on cowboys. But it is really fascinating to learn that knights were not what 
we think of them as being because she talks about how they were not even like English. They were usually from Germany and Mm -hmm. they did not follow a moral code in like a chivalrous manner. They were just like mercenaries who would like kill people for hire. They were not like helping (laughs) peasants or anything like that. There were like more mercenary mercenaries back then. Like there were like landed knights, you know, who would be rewarded not directly in money, but rather in like land, which is, I guess, money with extra, (laughs) money with extra steps. Um, But yeah, and they, yeah, they didn't follow this like hard and fast rule, but there were like, you know, those renowned for their so quote unquote chivalry. But the fact there was a spectrum, there could be a good knight and a bad knight, I think is where, I don't know, we want to remember the good ones. Yeah. Yeah. So w- what she says about knights is interesting, but what she talks about with cowboys, I think explains a lot about like why they're so popular in America and in American culture, because they emerged after the Civil War as a cultural figure that both the North and the South could equally identify with because the West was not yet made. It was not yet born in mm-hmm. like a cultural sense. People before the rise of like cowboys in literature and then films, they did not really have opinions on the West. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what popularized it as an idea. And so the cowboy, all Americans were sort of like, granted permission to identify with it. And partly because it was so mythologized, I don't even think in like the present day that people feel any sort of um, reservation in like donning a cowboy hat, um, which we'll get to actually after the Moskowitz article a bit. But what were your takes when you're like glancing over what I wrote in the docket about this? I just think that it's like America was always, I think, looking for like, like a male symbol of like, what makes America different from past things. Like there had not been cowboys in other like countries, culture, like in other like North American cultures, like, you know, cowboys, buckaroos come from vaqueros, like come from Mexican cow hands. Um, but this was like a wholly a new invention that we could lay claim to that England didn't have any part in, <laughs> you know? Or, I mean, she does bring up that like cowboys were largely Latino or black. They mm-hmm. often weren't um, white, even though they were then, depicted as being white in most media. They also, in terms of an idea, they allow both rural folks and even city dwellers an opportunity to be part of the fantasy of the cowboy. And that, and that, at that time after um, the civil war, there's, there was a, a, a vacuum of, of American, the American aesthetic and to yeah. have something, a, a, something mm-hmm. to cheer for. Yeah. Was, um, I, I kind of like timing. the wild West urbanism, you know, where there's like, you know, the general store and there's a saloon mm-hmm. and there's a few little businesses yeah. and it's very walkable, you know, <laughs> too. Yeah. Like, I think it's kind of nice. Um, I don't know. I, in a past episode when we talked about knights, I was saying like, I, I, I love the idea of knights and all that. Um, I probably over romanticize it, especially given that like, if my family, the family, my family in Europe at that time would have just been like Jewish peasants, you know, during night times. And then for cowboys, like I, I would not have, my family would not have been cowboys back in the day. I don't, not to say there weren't Jewish cowboys, but it seems <laughs> not likely. I'm sure we would have just run a small general store in a town getting like, you know, besieged by bandits and outlaws and stuff. Mm-hmm. Oh, but, I meant to research this and put it in the docket, but my sister got into sort of like looking into the ancestry of my family and she found like a relative who was one of like th- the first people on death row in California. Um, <laughs> he was like, like a great, 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 great grandfather or something like that. But what he got on death row for was in the wild west where basically he was in a saloon Someone ripped his beard out. He was pissed. And then like a year later, he thought he saw the same person in the bar. (laughs) Uh, They don't really know if it was the same person, but he stabbed him in the heart and then he died. Um, And so then he was on death row. So I have like cowboy ancestry. Yeah. To, yeah. to some extent. That's genuine cowboy ancestry. You can definitely wear a cowboy hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've earned your right. I, I, don't, I don't wear hats. Oh, I, yeah. I like showing that I have uh, nice hair. I, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like as a guy, it's like I never want to like have anyone for even a second think I, I'm bald or something. <laughs> oh my God, it's so. not so great. <laughs> That's interesting. I look when I when I uh, like 
get my hair really short on the sides and I wear a baseball cap, I look almost bald. But I think it's a good little experiment for me, preparing me for what is in store in my jeans, <laughs> really. But yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I feel like if you're worried about being bald, always look at your mom's brother if they have one, because mm-hmm. you you inherit the genes for balding through your mother's yeah. side. Uh, all bald, all the men on my mom's oh. side uh, from uh, their 20s onwards. Yeah. yeah, I hope it doesn't come soon. I, I you always think guys look better with hair. <laughs> uh, but mm-hmm, yeah. yeah, but back to the article. So some of the parallels that she brings up between Knights and Cowboys are both became mythologized in the aftermath of political crises. Again, they were both not actually, quote unquote, native to their countries. They also both did not have a moral code to follow. And that said, although they did not follow moral codes, uh, the moral codes that they're purported to follow were literally identical because when cowboys became popularized in literature, the authors that started to write about cowboys actually were inspired by reading books about knights. Oftentimes in their same... um, In their lifetime, they actually transitioned from writing about knights to writing about cowboys. Oh, wow, yeah. It's like... it's in the world of pulp yeah. fiction. Like Cohen's jaw just dropped. <laughs> That's nuts. Because at that time when you're writing about something and you've never heard or never experienced the life of, of someone that does that job, mm-hmm. a cowboy in this case, you make assumptions based on other characters that you know or have been writing about. That makes, yeah. that makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. It's just one of those like stock characters that we love, yeah. and you take the same traits of that, like the damsel in distress in knights, then becomes like you know the the wonderful daughter of some like of the mayor or something <laughs> of the western town. Yeah, all those roles fit, and then samurais are kind of a knight adjacent thing as well. They also came from a uh, like a hectic period in there. Yeah. Samurais rose to power during like feudal Japan. And what happened is that like after Japan achieved like a cultural stasis and like things actually became like civil for a bit, there was like an overproduction of elites problem, which is where there was too many samurais and not enough lands and not enough like titles essentially to go around. So you'd end up with rogue samurais who would start like who'd foment rebellions and stuff and just become general nuisances. Um, I don't know. The overproduction of elites is like an interesting thing that does pop up in like society is before some great change. People say that we have that happening now. In America, yeah, with was so many DSA members. <laughs> oh, they say that's a common like talking point. I guess or no, not. just that like people in DSAs oftentimes are excess elites who like couldn't land oh. consulting jobs because there's a limited amount. Yeah, of those. Um, not that I prescribed to that idea. Yeah. Um, when I was at a, a White Sox game, I was looking around at all the like, you know, premium boxes. And I was saying to my friend, like, yeah, they've taken over more and more space to make premium boxes. And he said to me, and it'll never be enough. <laughs> so it's like because there's always going to be like I don't know they will get filled like there's people will yeah. fill it with capital essentially mm-hmm. coming from the top. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, one more point I want to bring up on the Moskowitz article before moving on to the next thing. She didn't write about this, but I actually think that Hawaii in many ways serves the same role in American culture as the idea of the West and the idea of cowboys because it also is like a place that sort of exists outside of the regionalism that we have in the country. And I think that like all states can like equally kind of identify with Hawaii or they like the idea of it. Like no one's going to like hate on Hawaii the way they hate on like Florida or Oregon or like any other state. I think it's also like the civil war and statehood thing is really interesting because like when the West was turning from territory to state, it was entirely wrapped up in the issue of slavery. It was just like, should this become a slave state or a free state or one of those weird compromised states <laughs> like Missouri became? And then so Hawaii gets to be so innocent and removed <laughs> of that. It's just so far after this, like you yeah. can't apply like any of that thing. It's like looking forward. We've talked about that on this podcast, a need for like America needs a frontier of some kind. And I think Hawaii was maybe our like penultimate frontier. If the last one was us planting a flag on the moon, you know, which we don't like technically own, but come on, we put a flag on it. So that's like, that's how you conquer things. It's a very like time honored thing. Um, but Hawaii was like, yeah, one of those last like foreign, yeah. far flung things. But uh, there's also the Philippines, which a lot of yeah. Americans don't know the history of it being literally a colony of the United States. Yeah. And that's even farther west than yeah. Hawaii. And our, um, yeah, our president at the time said that God came to him in a dream and told him to Christianize the Filipinos. 
and that like dictated yeah. our foreign policy. <laughs> that is like a wild time in American history. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, uh, there's this quote that I really like. I don't even remember where it came from, but someone once said that like, when the world looks to peace, they'll look to Hawaii, which Aww. I don't even think it's like ever, that's not like literally a, a prophecy or something, but it's always mm. such a beautiful idea. Yeah. <laughs> peace on earth. Yeah. Um, one thing that I was, I scribbled down here on my notes about um, Cowboys and Knights, the idea of rising to the occasion. That's like a, a common mm -hmm. thread in a lot of Western or cowboy stories is this, you know, he didn't have much going, but, you know, he saw an opportunity and he worked for it and, and, and conquered something or saved someone. Mm -hmm. And I think that is part of the idea that we all have when we think of cowboys or the idea of a cowboy is like, they are this character that we've seen in movies or we read in books and we've contrived this the idea of the cowboy rather than the actuality of what their job is they weren't out mm. catching bandits they were <laughs> yeah. you know moving livestock yeah um but it's interesting when you take a copy of a copy of a copy mm -hmm. it's, it starts to become its own thing yeah. yeah so seeing these idea of a knight a writer that writes books about knights writing a book about cowboys and then someone reading that book and saying, okay, I want to make a movie about cowboys and all mm -hmm. my information is from this book, then mm. this cowboy isn't really about wrangling cattle. It's about mm -hmm. saving damsels yeah. in distress. Or yeah. It's like the cultural idea of pirates, I think, is another like thing. Knights, cowboys, samurais, pirates. These are all like, you know, it, it's an easy costume. This isn't like a prescriptive, like there's things they say, do, wear. Like we have such a schema built up around it. And I've heard that like pirates are all very based on like one author's rendition of like we like one author gives us the peg leg the parrot on the shoulder the eye patch like all these things come from that i don't think cowboys are that like single source kind of thing i think it is a little more disparate but it, instead it kind of all funnels in <laughs> anyway like into this idea of yeah yeah what a cowboy looks like so in terms of depictions of cowboys like one of the earliest things to kind of start cementing the image of it was paintings and so Frederick Remington is like the ultimate kind of cowboy painter. My grandpa's a big fan of him. He has like a lot of books about Frederick Remington. He's an interesting guy. He was definitely like a blowhard, I would say, uh, and like very blustering guy. He was from like a well-to-do family in New York, uh, but he hopped out west to try and like make something of himself and it didn't really turn out. Um, but he still kept that idea of it with him. He really exaggerated his time in the West too. I thought that was funny when you were saying like that you were on a ranch out West, but you were very like lower your expectations about it. You were like, I was there for a short period. Like I'm not trying to overhang on that. Meanwhile, this guy like went out there, tried to run a ranching operation, went bankrupt and then made a career off of those like few months. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, on the depictions of cowboys, you mentioned in the docket, um, a painter named Mark Maggiore. Yeah. So he's, he's like amazing. Yeah. I, I figured he'd be right up your alley. If you didn't yeah. know about him, that would be yeah. wild. Did, did um, you know about him before? Yeah. I didn't. And it's really pretty. Yeah. It's beautiful stuff. It's, um, yeah, he's known for his depictions of like rising clouds and then just like great portrayals of cowboys themselves. Um, he's in the tradition of Remington. Remington was known for like his really focus on the figure. There were other Western painters who took more inspiration from like the beautiful geography and also like the animals and nature. But Remington was also really known for his depictions of horses. This was after photography was f figured out. So that means that we finally figured out how horses actually gallop. But they actually have. Uh, yeah, Moybridge. Yeah. yeah. They actually have all four legs off the ground yeah. at one time. And so he, like, Remington depicted his horses in that very realistic way, as opposed to there's, like, a pre-photography way to show horses where all their legs are stuck out in front of them, which is really funny. <laughs> um, but, yeah, Maggiore, and then his style rocks, too. Like, so he was born in France, so he has that leg up on Americans in terms of being stylish. But he came to America when he was 15 and, like, got to see the West, and it just blew his mind. And I'm in, like, kind of in it, like a menswear discussion forum thing, People would always post photos of Mark Maggiore, and I just thought he was just a cool, styled guy. I didn't know he was like also a, like amazing, classically trained painter. But, yeah. yeah, goes to the costume. We we remember what people wear, how they wear it, and it adds to the aura of 
him as a creator and as a, as a maker. Mm -hmm. It's an important thing. I would be so bummed out if he was just a guy who wore like cargo shorts and sneakers. And like, I would just be like, Really? Like or, you paint these amazing yeah, guys and you yeah. don't think like, oh, or, maybe I could yeah, dress like if that. If it was like John Fetterman painting them. <laughs> yeah, no. Or yeah. he just wears a beat up pair of cowboy boots, an old mm -hmm. pair of jeans and a mm -hmm. pearl snap shirt every day. Mm -hmm. And then you'd say, that's his uniform. Yeah, that's what that he makes does. Sense. That's, that, that is cowboy. In a sense. That's, yeah. that's mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So cowboy writings was an early way to like cement that in Americans minds. And then, yeah, cowboy paintings. Um, but then Cowboys and television is like crazy. I think that's like how we got to where we are. Like, yeah. I, I had one thing that I was going to say about uh, landscape painting and um, like capturing the idea of a cowboy in a, 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 wa a large landscape. Oftentimes the idea of a cowboy is a stark masculine representation of a tough guy. And to place them is a very small piece of a painting while surrounding it with a beautiful sunset and clouds and mm -hmm. rolling hills and mountains and livestock. It allows for the painting to not just be about the cowboy, but bringing beauty into the space and allowing you to remember that it is only just the cowboy is one small part of this space. And it, I think as we kind of look into how cowboys worked in their job and, and how they operated. They were a very small part of the environment. And I think that they oftentimes knew that in terms of how you dress to stay dry or to protect yourself. They are just a very small part of the environment. And I think that acknowledging that is a powerful thing that if you are a true survivalist or someone that spends a lot of times in the outdoors, mm -hmm. and you realize that mother nature has such a large leg up on us. Mm -hmm. And in some of those landscape paintings, you can kind of feel it. You feel that it is yeah. a, a, a minute part of Yeah. Landscape. Like the sublime. Correct. From romanticism. Yeah. yeah I, I think with like those paintings, you can see that like, some of them are really about the cowboy and some of them are more so about the West, like how he fits into that. Um, when you're talking about like how small the cowboy is in this like grand place, especially like when you think about the Grand Canyon, just the, these geographic formations that like people have not seen anything like this. You know, you don't see this out east. This is like not the worn down Appalachia Mountains. Like this is <laughs> like truly dramatic. I think about the a cowboy prayer. Have you ever heard that? It's like it's a poem. It's a song kind of thing. Johnny Cash did a rendition of it. But it's like the idea is that it's a cowboy like doing his version of a prayer to God. And one of the things that it, uh, in it is like, make me as big and open as the plains and as honest as the horse between my knees. It's kind of like we think we have this idea of like that the cowboy kind of prays to this environment and he has a unique kind of way to commune with it that we don't. Yeah. I sort of like hobos praying to the Big Rock Candy Mountain. <laughs> I love Just that like song. That. Yeah. It's one of the best. Um, Cowboys and television is, I think, how a lot of our understanding of what cowboys are was taught to us or taught to our parents or you yeah. know, the, the general public. Because cowboys in literature, not everyone had access to it, but the explosion of TVs in every home and yeah. weekly TV shows like The Lone Ranger and Anza mm -hmm. and Gunsmoke and... Things like that were a streamline for Americans to participate in the world yeah. of cowboy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In my like love of like mid-century illustrations and stuff, some things you'll see like in a depiction of like a boy like, oh, with this product you can take care of your whole family. And there's like the daughter in a dress and there's the boy in a complete cowboy costume. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> that was yeah. just like an accepted, like I kind of did that as a kid. My favorite outfit when I was a kid was a... Michael Jordan jersey and shorts like I mean it was the 90s you know yeah. Chicago Bulls and all that and then cowboy boots it's one of the uh, things I also yeah. love cowboys but I couldn't like choose that over Michael Jordan who I also loved yeah you're styling <laughs> yeah I was you like yeah. but that's like I feel like that's a streetwear outfit you could do nowadays <laughs> you could do the full Jordan kit and then the cowboy boots yeah. Um, but yeah, like in the fifties, like boys would just completely dress up as that. Like it was just like this archetype cowboys and Indians was a game that you'd play. Yeah. Like, yeah. um, in Avondale, actually there used to be many theaters along Milwaukee Avenue. One of them was actually dedicated only to Western films. And I was reading about it and like 
little boys used to go dressed up as cowboys. And the theater, I imagine, was just all little boys dressed up as cowboys. Yeah. Shooting their cap guns <laughs> at the screen. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. No, and there was yeah. enough just content there. Of course. Um, I was trying to find the percentage. I can, could not track it down, but I heard that it was like it was like 65% of all shows on television like at the high point of westerns were westerns like yeah <laughs> it was uh i found that there were 30 westerns on prime time in 1959 wow. and i believe there were only four channels at that point so yeah that's pretty insane a lot of this died off in what's called the rural purge which is where um, american television networks pivoted to just like urban content like yeah. they ended stuff like beverly hillbillies uh, and they went to more uh, like Sesame Street, you know, that takes place yeah. in, uh, you know, a street in New York. Rural Americans felt really left behind by this, you know, that we weren't having yeah. shows like Mayberry anymore. Mm-hmm. And it was more just. But then they got the Hunger Games. It was. Oh, well, they had the no, Hunger Games. Which is dystopian. But yeah. yeah. But I think that like. Um, it was more Mary Tyler Moore, The Odd Couple. Things yeah, like no, that. that, that's, yeah, that's the next space. year. I was just like trying to think of other stuff. And yeah. like, yeah, the 70s and then into I the love 80s. Lucy. Cheers. Yeah. No, Honey all that, Yeah. Suburban, maybe, but mm-hmm. oftentimes urban. And I think that like now, as Yellowstone is so popular, like this shows that like rural Americans felt left behind by this. And even though rural Americans are a smaller group than they were at that period, suburban Americans do not see themselves in, you know, urban depictions and stuff. They don't see themselves in New Girl you yeah. know, or other like city things. That's a very dated example to give. But they see themselves in Yellowstone. You yeah. Know? And I, I think that something I'm going to go back to, to uh, design real quick. Virgil talks about when you take a concept like the Air Force One, if you are going to redesign it, you only need to change 3%. Wow. So yeah. uh-huh. taking something like the idea of a cowboy and changing it 3%, mm-hmm. put it back out, and oftentimes mm-hmm. you're going to get a lot of bites because it's something that people understand, but they want a new story or they want mm-hmm. a new main character or they yeah. want you know they want something new, but not... Totally new because mm-hmm. that would be hard to connect to anything. Pivot to. Off yeah. Of it, yeah. So it makes sense that like, okay, how are we going to recycle these ideas? A <laughs> Cowboy <little bit>? and <laughs> like there needs to be yeah. something else to it. Um, and yeah, like terms like neo western or post western get tossed around. I think in the cowboy movies I've seen, I've probably seen more neo and post westerns than I've seen classic, just straight up cowboys and Indians. Mm-hmm. Like, um, in terms of examples, No Country for Old Men. That's a neo western. Hell or um, High Water. Hell or, I haven't seen that. It's one of my favorite movies. Mm-hmm. It's spectacular, but it's definitely a neo-Western. Yeah, it's like yeah. the ones that make commentary on it. Unforgiven is like an earlier, not neo-Western, but like post-Western, where it's about like that it's not fun and cool to be a cowboy all the time. You're racked by like, you know, lives you've taken and like, you know, how hard your life is out there. It's Clint Eastwood who did so many conventional mm-hmm. Westerns, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. But yeah, we'll, we'll get to Western movies a little say, bit later. I was going to say, that's coming up, right? Um but before we get to that, I do want to like talk about this idea that circles back to the Jennifer Moskowitz article we discussed earlier. But I think that one reason that Western wear has been persistently popular across decades is because we've largely been permitted to appropriate Western clothing regardless of what region we live in. So I don't wear cowboy clothing, but I went to SAC, an art school, and like even the people who are the most sensitive to cultural appropriation, they'd all wear cowboy hats or cowboy mm-hmm. boots it's when they go game. to their like art school parties. Yeah. Um, they wear them to Berlin. Like yeah. it was not any something that they'd have a problem with. Mm-hmm. Um, another example I think of that too is how uh, the word y'all has been popularized, um, <laughs> which I'm not a fan of. I don't know if either of you say it, but my feelings towards it can be sort of summed up by this reductress headline which is sort of like an onion headline where it said like hey y'all tries friend from new jersey <laughs> it just always sounds inauthentic yeah. um when someone dons a cowboy hat or cowboy boots they're just having fun but uh yeah there's just always like this slight pause when someone who's not from the south says y'all or it's just a little yeah. bit weaker they don't they don't really have the like confidence not, behind it, it yeah. yeah there's not it's, it's not boisterous like yeah, it doesn't it's not come sound from the chest authentic. pronunciation is different yeah no, that's true. Um, I think yeah. of the meme where it's like, you can always do an Italian accent. It's never racist. <laughs> you can always wear a cowboy hat. It's never racist. It's never like, yeah. it's just yeah, free to everyone to like kind of take their little twist yeah. on it. Which kind of goes back to the idea of it being like a, a um, 
an idol for an American culture to say, yeah. okay, we claim this and this is ideally for those that are American or close to it. Yeah. But yeah, Kona, do you ever hear anything from anywhere from anyone about like people being sensitive about like non-Western people wearing cowboy clothing? Gatekeeping. Yeah. yeah no, okay. So the only <laughs> people that come in and ask specifically where we're from yeah. is people from Texas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they'll say, I grew up in Texas and I see a lot of things, like a lot of Western pieces. Like, are you from Texas? And I'll say no, but I, I always wish I was a cowboy and kind of wish I was from Texas yeah. and they'll go, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, all right, keep my eye on you yeah, while yeah. you're on thin. But you're it, thin was, it is interesting that you say that. Cause like that, when we opened up our doors to everyone, you sometimes have people that are angry or upset and have their opinions and are ready to share mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And we've had, you know, that here and there, but never over, We've never been, no, no one's ever claimed that we were appropriating culture yeah. or, 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 mm -hmm. or, which we kind of are. <laughs> we, we definitely are. And yeah, that, yeah, yeah. It's, the question, yeah, it's just questions like, so? Yeah, <laughs> it's the thing, yeah, like, yeah, it, we're appropriating it, it so. Yeah. yeah. We're, I would like to think that we are reimagining and restructuring um, items mm -hmm. to be more modern and to yeah. be more timely mm -hmm. and, and more exciting. Something that I'll dive into real quick. Um, I started my art career as a very young person drawing. I would draw on everything. I would draw and draw and draw. And my mom would just lay out paper and draw and say, draw more, tape them together, and then continue drawing. And then as I went into high school and college, or high school, I started dealing with some more heavy emotional things and needed to escape that. And so I would go out and draw and glue up paintings and glue up drawings and glue up do big graffiti throws in my hometown. My hometown is a very small hometown, not a lot of graffiti, very affluent space. And mm -hmm. I became known very, very quickly. My mm -hmm. graffiti name was Zorro. Mm -hmm. It's tagging a big Z O R R O on things. I was putting up big paintings of her photographs from Lee Jeffries, a photographer that I really, really liked at the time. So I was doing all this compulsive art making and was writing and, and sharing my, you know, developing my, my brand of Zorro, this, the masked mm -hmm. uh, vigilante. 16, got caught. <laughs> yeah. Six cop cars, they're lining me up. They're trying to get me to confess on the spot. I'm like, I think I need to talk to my parents. Like, yeah. I, I, did you get I haven't heard about this. Damn near. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I did not get handcuffed, but a uh, detective came to my house. Whole big nine, you know, whole big mm -hmm. deal. Um, had to pay criminal damage. It's on my record. It seemed like the worst thing that had ever happened to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in that moment, I realized, okay, I can, I want to be someone that creates disruption. I want to be someone that, that is an, an art maker, but I'm learning this may, this career path may not have the most longevity. But I can take these this concept or the practice of making and and repetitive compulsive making and apply it to something else that I really love, and that's costumes and clothing. And using canvas and denim and cotton rather than spray paint and glue and paper was just as an effective, if not more effective way of sharing my ideas or my my concepts. I think that's so interesting to go from like, yeah, it, it's the compulsiveness you're talking about is really interesting. You had something to get out yeah. and you, you freely admit that, that yeah. like, this was kind of like, I got to get something out there. And I feel like graffiti is kind of like a light attack on the world around you. You know, you get a lot of pent up stuff and it's mm -hmm. so interesting to see that transition of you being like, you know, essentially doing a crime <laughs> and doing, then transitioning no, to being doing a, a crime. Yeah. To being a business owner where, you know, like I always say like graffiti is lightly destructive. You know, you're covering something, you're applying something, but you're covering something, you're changing something in a kind of like non-consensual way yeah, yeah. and rebellious way. Um, and then going to be like, you're now like a tax paying business owner where you're part of like a chamber of commerce and stuff. And you'd be pretty annoyed if someone graffitied your store, yeah. you know, and it's such an interesting, like, I don't know, like a classic maturity thing. But yeah. like what you learn during that period is applied. Like you're just 
you're using like the principles of like sampling and graffiti and tagging and that, but in a new identity as the Cone Ranger. Correct. Yeah. 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 Most of your garments do have the name of your company on them, which does make me think of tagging. Um, exactly what it is. Personally, I, I shy away from clothing with logos and brands. So the two shirts that I have from your brand, I don't think this one. Has Just on one. the tag. Just, a, yeah, just, just on the, the actual corner. tag, which yeah. we tag which is, on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, tasteful yeah. tagging, all a big fan. Yeah. Of it. yeah, but the other one I have um, of mm-hmm. yours is like a chain link fence. Mm-hmm. There's no, there's nothing on mm-hmm. it. Yeah, that's more of my thing. But I can see the parallels between what you're doing with graffiti and the and Cone Ranger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's funny going from Zorro to the Lone Ranger as well, because like it's all, it's all on considered. that spectrum, it's like they are both like gentlemen kind of outlaws. But um, vigilante, yeah, vigilante, yeah, definitely. I don't know. I've always I've identified more with like the more stand up kind of law man. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. like I don't know. I'm trying to think of my Western figures that I like. I like um, from like Fistful of Dollars. I like just Blondie as he's called there. Just that's just yeah. a personal kind of connection, I guess. But yeah, I don't know. I can never see myself as an outlaw, even in like playing Red Dead Redemption too. I don't like to yeah, do too true. much. Ne'er do well behavior. I like to be an upstanding citizen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I do want to circle back to that regionalism idea real quick. There was this New York Times, I think, think piece a few years ago that was titled Disdain for the Less Educated is the Last Acceptable Form of Prejudice. Mm-hmm. And I think that the two things are closely linked. We're like, uh, oftentimes for Americans who are really, like, really in the thick of like the polarization in our culture and in like engaged in culture wars, they like conflate the two where like people from like certain regions are less educated and they have like a dislike or a hatred for the people living in those places. Mm -hmm. Me as an urbanist, I'm just evaluating the places. Yeah. I mean, regions, they do have like, they have their own pride. They have their own history and stuff. I mean, especially Texas. It's and what you were saying about like that it's Texas people specifically who kind of like raise an eyebrow at what you're doing. I think Texas like wants to be a part of America and apart from it like all the time. They always have this kind of crisis. When we were when we did our department stores episode, I was thinking about Neiman Marcus and I went to their store there, which is just classic like 50s modernist kind of on the inside. There's no like. Texas twang to it in any noticeable way other than the fact they probably have a pretty big boot department (laughs) compared to a Neiman Marcus in New York City or something but I think that like Texas goes these periods where it's like oh we fit into the rest of America Dallas is is a major capital city just like any other one you know and then they kind of like buck away from that like no we wear cowboy hats here like (laughs) you can bring your gun everywhere (laughs) like yeah and so I think that these places like I don't know they're really complicated Um, I think we should like I, I think you should shed your regionalism. Get to know those people. Oh, I got one thing about... I don't know if we're still talking about this or not, but the parallels between knights and cowboys. I thought of this when I was reading through what you guys had laid out. There aren't knights. There aren't a lot of modern-day knights. Mm-hmm. Th- that is something from the past that we yeah. reevaluate. Yeah. yeah. But something that's so interesting about the cowboy right now is a lot of times our idea of a cowboy is based on 1930s to 50s television. 30s to te- 50s television. But there are still cowboys mm-hmm. and there are still people working as livestock producers and, yeah. and running cattle, driving cattle that have ranches and dress and still mm-hmm. are creating the idea of the cowboy yeah. while we as Americans are seeing just the trope. Yeah. Something that, you know, the is so fascinating about the idea is that it's still developing. There's still mm-hmm. while not a lot of people do what cowboys do, there are still Yeah. It's, it's like a living concept. It's not like sealed in time like Correct. knights are. Um, or pirates. Yeah. Well, I mean uh, the idea. <laughs> I watched those on YouTube, uh, the cowboy cooking videos. You know that guy? Uh, he like cooks for actual like cow hands out west, like in Montana or okay. something. He has a little like tent set up and he makes coffee on a percolator and he like grills stuff up. I don't know. It's like I was like, oh yeah, people, guys are still doing that. <laughs> like they're still living and they're still yeah reinventing. I mean, what is a percolator? It's like an uh, older style of making coffee. It's like it as it heats up. Yeah, oh. it, it, it travels up a tube and it like spills. I only over know the, the word side. percolator the from song. the house song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Mm-hmm. But yeah, the next point we can get into is on how one of our previous episodes, Men in Uniform, in Uniforms with Paul Fussell, he talked about how all outfits that we wear are sort of on a spectrum from uniform to costume and how there's this really good scene in Back to the Future 3 where Marty McFly, he purchased a cowboy outfit in the 80s that was very flashy and then he wears it and goes back in time to the Wild Wild West Mm -hmm. and he walks into a saloon and people start laughing and ask if he's from the circus because it is like too bright and flashy Mm -hmm. and I think it has rhinestones and tassels and stuff. But yeah, if you contrast like the cowboy cowboys in the film compared to like what he's wearing, it shows how there's like a spectrum in cowboy outfits, Mm -hmm. Uh, which we also talked, we didn't actually get into it, but that much, but in the same episode, Men in Uniform, we talked about the village people and how there's a cowboy in the group, which doesn't really make sense. Like (laughs) it makes sense from like a fetishized gay male (laughs) angle. Yeah. But, like, it's not, like, a uniform. It's not, like, a, a job. But it yeah. is a job. <laughs> yeah. It can be. Yeah. 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 Neither is Indian chief. <laughs> and it, was almost, it was almost like the, the uniform was created by majority of cowhands or, like, cowboys. Like, it, it, it wasn't one company that said, this is what cowboys mm-hmm. wear. Yeah. But maybe... It was grassroots up, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or, or function, you know, what, mm-hmm. what worked. And then also what movie and TV producers and costumers saw and saw in photographs or paintings and then reiterated re- into yeah. the costume. Yeah, it's like um, tradition is the accumulation of successful cultural innovation. So the way that the cowboy's outfit was developed over time slowly by so many people is that, you know? It's like fascinating how they derived at such like a unique look through function, but it has so much form. Yeah. And yeah, the kind of like outfit that Marty McFly wears, like the very exaggerated Western thing, is kind of the the 1950s nudie suit, as they called it. They talk about this on the Nymphed alumni episode about cowboy and Western fashion, but uh, Nudie Cohn was just this like uh, Ukrainian Jewish guy born in Kiev who uh, came over to America and just started like making the cowboy outfits for everyone on the Grand Old Opry and stuff. And this is where the rhinestones basically come from. Like this is where like the super hyped up glam version of cowboy wear comes from. And I think this is like a theme of what we've talked about, which is like some of the best examinations of cowboys are from people who are outside of it. Whether you're Frederick Remington, you're just a rich kid from upstate New York, or you're a French guy like Marc Maggiore, or you're Ralph Lauren, you know, a Jewish guy from Brooklyn, um, making like jeans popular in a different way. Yeah, you like need to be outside of it. Not to say that like a great Western wear maker or thinker couldn't come out of like Wyoming, but like... I don't know if it's the air you breathe, you're not going to notice it. Yeah. I see that too. Um, have you seen Back to the Future 3 Con? Of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Big cowboy viewing. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the 80s very much. In general, I'm not that much of like a movie guy. My taste in movies are pretty bad. Um, yeah. So I haven't seen that many Western films. But before we get into the gay Western films, I want to talk about are there any Western films you either of you want to bring up? Um, I already brought it up earlier, but um, Hell or High Water is a more contemporary view of of the cowboy. It's two brothers and they're bank robbers, but it's set in in a pretty modern setting, um, Texas. And another one that is a modern make of a classic, the new True Grit film. Costumes, Mm storyline, great film. But it is one of those things where it's it's again just a recreation of a of a past piece, yeah. which is is very common. Uh, High Noon, The Searchers, um, are two films that are made in the fifties, sixties, and that is those are two pieces that I look to when I'm seeking inspiration for shirt. Uh, the cuts of shirts and bandanas and honestly it's it's more styling so when we're styling shoots or or coming up with ways to reimagine um silhouettes i look to a lot of movies for and not even necessarily just westerns it's a great place to start but a lot of movies and film costuming is a very exciting place for me to imagine re 
purposed garments. Yeah, you look for all movies with sexy guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, that that may be a through line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Western movies I like. I, one of the parts I like about Western movies is like this is kind of pretentious, but when people ask me what movies I like, and I think that they don't, they're not going to hate me if I say this, I'll say that I like movies about like a man from a certain time who has outlived that time and now must like deal with a changing world. Mm -hmm. um, so I like the Grand Budapest Hotel is maybe one of my most like famous like favorite movies. There's some line in it about how like he was made for an era that had passed by the time he was born. Like he's a he's an out of mode model. Casino is another one. It's more of a conventional mobster movie, but it's like growing up in Las Vegas and growing up in the corporate Las Vegas, we all know. It's like, no, right before the great corporate take takeover, there were kind of cowboys in a sense of these mob guys out there like running these independent operations and fighting each other. And then, yeah, a lot of one like genre of cowboy movie is like, you know, uh, modernization encroaching in the West ending. Yeah. Um, the first Red Dead Redemption game like takes place in like the late 1890s. Mm -hmm. You can go to a town and like someone's getting a car brought in <laughs> and stuff. And so I always, when they made like Red Dead Redemption 2, I was like, what's their plan now? Like if they do anything after this? And the answer was they're like, uh, 10 years prior to the events of Red Dead Redemption 1. And I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> I'm like, you guys yeah. are like, you're inching towards the precipice of the them. end of the West. And like, let's go more comfortably into the earlier period of the West. I think Star um, Wars did that too, right? Yeah. It's yeah. like, uh, instead of moving things forward, let's, uh, let's go see what we didn't uh, sum up previously. But yeah, on, on the end of the West, I have a very good documentary to recommend it's called Sweetgrass, and it was created by an anthropologist at Harvard. It's a movie, a documentary that's like a form of visual anthropology, but she documented the last ever American shepherds to herd a flock of sheep long distance without the use of trucks or modern equipment. Um, and they go through like mountains and prairies and like through forests. And there's two cowboys managing like thousands of sheep, um, and they're brought almost to like a breaking point throughout the course of the film. And yeah, it's really interesting to watch. I recommend it to both of you. I think you'd both like it. Yeah. But yeah, on that, uh, to get back to gay cowboy films, the plot of Sweetgrass is pretty similar to Brokeback Mountain, minus the gay stuff. So I actually haven't seen Brokeback Mountain in full. I've only seen it like in I clips have. here what and there. <laughs> it's a wonderful love story. Yeah. Well, no. it's, it's hard to watch. No, you and don't also understand how, how deep my bad taste in movies is it's like if a movie is good i can only watch it in clips uh, on um, youtube that's the worst way to consume stuff no it's a great movie and to the straight guys listening if you're a anne hathaway appreciator it's a must watch yeah i have to say as well it's also it's also good to watch love stories just coming from a gay man that's grown up watching straight love yeah. stories my mm -hmm. whole life yeah it there's there's something in i believe in every good narrative story that you can connect to mm -hmm. and I think that like seeing what they went through and how they had to operate to express love to each other is something that you can like connect with in one way mm -hmm. or another um, whether you're straight or not yeah no yeah I've never watched many romance films which is why I was so awkward when I was single um <laughs> but I do like Brokeback Mountain and I think that um one thing that people might think when they watch it is like, oh, this is far-fetched. Like, this is all just, like, fantasy. Yeah. Like, these cowboys would not do this. But no, actually, it's a pretty, like, believable premise mm -hmm. that these two guys that had to spend, like, so much time in isolation together went gay. Um, yeah. It's, like, a pretty believable plot. Mm -hmm. I, I should have done more, like, research on this. I, it's what I shouldn't, like, be able to talk too much on this area here. <laughs> like, um, but... This phenomenon, like kind of in Brokeback Mountain, of like conventionally masculine guys working hard jobs doing gay stuff, uh, is sometimes called bud sex, B U D, like two friends having sex. And it's been like studied, and like they do these really fascinating interviews with guys who like are like oil rig workers or something, and they'll meet a guy and they'll just kind of have an understanding of what's going to happen. And then they'll like, you know, call and then like, hey, I'll meet you in a, like a truck parking lot somewhere and we'll just, you know, have our little time together and we'll go back to our wives. And it's just wow. very understood and it's situational and it's compartmentalized. And these guys have no, like, unlike in the movie Brokeback Mountain, they have no, like, intention of... I kind of forget the ending nowadays, but... Um, they don't, want to having, having they, they don't want it to interfere with their lives. Like, yeah. they, they want to just keep on, like, they want everything. Like, they want... 
the hardworking masculine job. They want the wife. They want the kids. They want all that. And they also want to meet up in a parking lot and have anonymous gay sex. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 I feel like as like a gay guy, I don't even like that seems as foreign to me as everything straight people do in a way because I'm not part of that. Like mm-hmm. I feel like for people who are closeted, they have to have like they get their guard up once they learn that like I'm I'm gay like that I'm open, you know, mm-hmm. like that sort of thing seems alien to me, but it's, it's beautiful depicted in mm-hmm. film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like when they interview these guys, they always use the term like men who have sex with men. Yeah. You know, yeah. which is the most like sanitized, like indisputable term. Cause all these guys would instantly reflectively say, Oh, I'm not gay. Yeah. Of you course know? they're, they're living in the, the idea of what they want without yeah. truly processing how they're yeah. feeling it almost or, or even having to label it is an interesting thing that, that they are like okay i'm willing to do this interview about bud sex yeah. but you know yeah i would never want to be labeled or be seen yeah. as a gay mm-hmm. man yeah it almost seems like when people talk about conceptions of like uh, sexuality in pre-abrahamic life like because abrahamic religions like old testament judaism forward like really did kind of tamp down on homosexuality where there's theories that beforehand it was just kind of an accepted thing like as long as you are faithful to your wife and you provide for her and all that like what does that have anything to do with what you do on the side like they gave men so many rights in that period like you have all these rights like your woman has no rights you also have the right to have some like (laughs) to mess around on the side with other men since you guys are all in power (laughs) basically yeah Um, but i mean like in ancient rome when there was same-sex sex it, there always had to be one person in the situation that was of a lower status. Mm-hmm. If it was same status, that was viewed as being like taboo um, yeah. because it was Whoa. about power. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, there's also this good anthropology article on the topic called Tea Room Trade, uh, <laughs> where this anthropologist, who at the time was closeted, wrote this whole book on um, what are they called? T- tea Rooms? Why did, why did that not come to me? Okay, but basically, like, public bathrooms, like, men have sex in. And he was, like, just going in and watching. And then he would, like, <laughs> follow the people who were who were doing that home. And then he would, like, leave them a letter. And then he would, like, get them to do interviews with him. And it was, it's such a wild thing. It's, yeah. like, modern academics could not do that. No, yeah. yeah. That, um, uh-huh. for, <laughs> for better and for worse, I would say. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I also feel that 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 there's a, the the idea that oftentimes in military there is like experimentation and and mm-hmm. with same sex interactions. But if you think about the the lifestyle of a cowboy, even if you do make it to your destination or your boomtown that you're trying to go to, and you just got paid for your cattle run, you you go to the saloon and it's like you got. Yeah, you either have fellow guys that you were mm-hmm. out on the range with, or you pay for an evening upstairs with a with a, you know. Yeah, but sometimes it would be a long time before the town would have the first woman. Like I visited um, Eureka, California, which uh, is not a ghost town. It's like a historic town that's now like a national park of sorts. Although people who are in national parks would correct me; it's something else. But I learned like through going there that the town originally had like a thousand men or something before the first woman arrived. And when she arrived, they threw like a party with like fiddles and it was like (laughs) this big deal. But yeah, it would be like a while before like Mm -hmm. women would go out that far because things were dangerous. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah. In a past up, I talked about uh, The American Astronaut, which is this like experimental art film about cowboys in space. Um, It's all roughnecks and saloons are just full of grizzled men and then there's this one character called uh all the women have been driven out of this world and there's one character called the boy who actually saw a woman's breast and he's held up as like a god king among them and he just gets in front of everyone and tells them what it was like um it's a very absurdist movie but like that really is how it must like feel in those areas i um and then the other gay cowboy movie you put on here i have oh, but seen. before we get that i want to say i think i got you one I think I got the name of the town in California wrong. It's not Eureka. I think it might be Columbus. But anyways, 
Uh, I'm getting this off, but the point was made. But yeah, we can get into the power of the dog. Have you dog. have you both seen that? I have seen that. I was also gonna say Strange Way of Living is a new one. It's a short film with uh, Pedro Pascal and Kevin Bacon. Yeah, Whoa. wild one. But it's like they're almost poking fun at points, but then it's also it's it's like right on the verge of humorous, but it's also kind of like a, a tale of two men. Oh, yeah. Wanting to be together, but not making it work. And then also seeing the, the, how family can kind of add an, a, a more difficult element into a relationship. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, power of the dog was a fascinating one. And I, I was also looking to that movie to be, you know, hopefully a more positive representation of a, of a queer yeah. or gay cowboy Western it's character. It's even less positive than Brooklyn Mountain. It's it is, and it's 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 a thriller. It's yeah. it's a it, who done it, uh, and it becomes the characters are very very exciting. Costumes again, great, um, and it's a great watch. But it 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 does kind of further that twisted uh, narrative of of the of the gay cowboy. Yeah, um, for me. Power of the Dog was interesting because it showed how, like, at the time, whether you were, like, kind of open or fully closeted, the difference between, like, Phil and Peter, Phil being the closeted one, Peter being the the effeminate one who was sort of open in a way, um, both were, like, equally detested and disliked by the people around them, but for wildly different reasons. Like, Phil was just, like, toxic and really horrible to everyone. And then Peter, like people just didn't like him because of discrimination. But I found that the way that Peter was depicted in the film, I think it, he depicts like an archetype that I think I find to be very honest and accurate as to like the gay experience that I think not that many films touch on Mm -hmm. where I think like gay youth is just like so awkward and it's like cringe. You don't even want to watch it. Like you want to sit up and leave. Uh, At least that's how I want to feel when I watch depictions like that. Because it uh, touches a nerve as to like how my youth was. Um, and there are other movies like that that kind of remind me of it, like Take Me to the River and Last Ferry, but Last Ferry less so. Um, but yeah, it's not something I see a lot in gay movies. It's just like there's no template. Like as a straight kid growing up, like you just, you see it everywhere, like malls of relationships at every single yeah. stage. Like what does middle school romance look like? What does high school romance, you know, prom giving a girl flowers, first kiss. Like, this is all Mm -hmm. very established. There's clear roles for you in that. Yeah, and then in these movies where they try and show gay life in, like, the 1800s, like, I think they try and capture, like, a feeling of, like, that these people have no blueprint. They don't know, like, Mm -hmm. I think they're they're often, like, taking this, like, uh, heteronormative kind of world they have and trying to apply it of just like, wait, am I the girl then? Like, yeah. <laughs> who's the girl what does that in make this? Me? Yeah. 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 They just like don't they they have to build some... the, the tracks as they go. Yeah. I remember reading um, a gay history <laughs> as a youth, like around when I came out or before I came out. And like, there was a period like pre Stonewall where gay people thought that um, same sex relations had to be between like a masculine and a feminine presenting. Uh, person, uh, they didn't understand like two masculine men or two feminine mm-hmm. women like having sex or dating. Yeah. Like it, they just couldn't wrap their head around it. Yeah, no, um, yeah. Which goes to show that for so long we've had this this construct laid out, and if you don't participate or engage in it, whether mm-hmm. it's a man and a woman or a man and a man or a woman and a woman, it. There's no, if there is no structure, then there's no understanding and there's no yeah. willingness to ask. You know, if you, if you yeah. just interviewed some people, you probably, probably would have had some better answers or, yeah. you know, some new discoveries. But I think oftentimes when people are trying to tell others what's going on without asking, you mm-hmm. don't always find the best answers. Yeah, you got to do your ethnographic research. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess next thing is kind of the the cowboy in today and the future. Like, what does Western aesthetics mean nowadays? And so we got the man to talk to about this, of course. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, let's do it. Um, 
So I, I brought this up earlier about Virgil and his alteration, his, his, his concept of alteration. <clears throat> and I think that with my background in graffiti and applying my photographs or graphics or drawings onto items, whether you like it or not, is a reworking of a trope of the cowboy. In no way are we trying to say that we're making clothes for people that are riding out west. Mm -hmm. If they were to wear jeans, that'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. But realistically, it's not what it's designed for. We're we're bringing the concept of the cowboy into more of an urban space and allowing for everyone to participate in it. Our racks at our shop are non-gendered. We lean towards tough, masculine garments, but we also have soft and and more feminine pieces as well and they're not divided in any way outside of upcycled and new garments so in that oftentimes in western wear stores there's a women's section there is a men's section mm -hmm. and in our shop our goal is to create an opportunity for people that are interested in trying on these types of clothes as a starting point to yeah. say mm -hmm. i would love to find a pair of chaps or I would love to find some very, very unique Carhartt reworked jacket with recycled fabric mm -hmm. on it. That's, that's where we hit. And that's mm -hmm. our goal is to create and to continue developing our lane. And that's in front of us. Mm -hmm. um, so that's bringing in those tropes and then rethinking them and, and, and challenging them and, and, graffitiing them and cutting them up and mending them and allowing that to be my tag on the piece. I think there is like in cowboy clothing, there's kind of a natural androgyny actually that's like already there. You don't need to like tease too much out of it. I think this happens whenever there's a very like kind of useful style of dressing like because women's cowboy style, like women, the first women to wear like dungarees and pants were like out west, basically, where it is kind of unreasonable to wear like a full skirt. Um, and so you have all the different like historical periods to like actually not have men and women. Like that's one of the few places you can do it. Mm -hmm. Cities, you know, in the 1860s to 1890s were probably a lot more like sexually dimorphic to use the like biological term for it mm -hmm. in terms of differences between how the how the uh, sex is dressed. Mm -hmm. yeah. The costume. Yeah, the costume. Yeah, I don't have too many ideas about like the future of cowboys, but I do see it a lot in popular culture through like Lil Nas X. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and but he's already moved beyond the whole like cowboy thing now. You know, yeah, he's, now he's pretending to be Jesus. Yeah, he did the devil fan. thing, and you know, he's doing the yeah. Jesus thing. You know? <laughs> I haven't even yeah. seen that music video. I don't really want uh, to. I don't know. It'll yeah. be on the background of a party sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I hang with the gay at, rugby team, it's it going to be like in the background. Track. Yeah, yeah, I'll see it there. <laughs> Um, it'll come oh, yeah. to me. I don't know if you know, but Joseph is on a gay rugby team. Yeah. <laughs> He's the Dragons? Gay, yeah. Nice. Wait, yeah. are you interested in playing? Uh, I don't know. I like kind of, I like the idea of rugby, but I feel like a, I feel like risk versus reward. Ah, uh, yeah. Like injury risk. No, it's true. I, I mean, I, yeah, like I, I always I, try and get people into it and they're just like, oh, why weren't you playing last season? It's like, oh, well, I broke my scapula and then yeah. I got a concussion and all that, but yeah, I don't know. Actually, if you join, you might outcompete me for tallest guy, which which means I might lose my position as the line out jumper. So never mind. Don't join the dragons. <laughs> See you later. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did get the idea with this episode when you were talking about people from Texas side eyeing you a bit. I thought like, oh, you could get cred though if you were to be at a rodeo and you were at like state fairs doing like one of those competitions, like. I don't know. That would be like a fun thing for you to do in your, do in your time if you've ever thought about it. That would be amazing. <laughs> and the thing about it that would be so cool is we always think about like we're makers, but we also use Instagram as like a tool to share what we're doing. And we like try and try and try not to take it too seriously and remind ourselves that it is just a tool. And that like when we do stunts, air quote stunts, it's in an effort to just kind of pull more focus in on the clothes that we're mm -hmm. making. Oh, yeah. And so 
that would be a perfect example of like Cone <laughs> enrolls in his you know first rodeo yeah. and then just like film it, film yeah, it. like with a bunch like, of like twelve year old boys yeah, yeah. City <laughs> Slicker Cone in, in his in his reworked Western where what is it? trying they, to wrestle a, a a baby cow a calf. Is that they, they start the they kids on calves? Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. I don't think they start them on goats or something. I yeah, bet you could pick pump. up a cow. Yeah. No, they're probably too heavy. <laughs> Not a cow, but a calf, maybe. I, I really want to go to a rodeo. They're um, amazing. If you ever have an opportunity to go to a rodeo. Yeah. Um, one of my carpenters um, is involved in Chateados, which is the like Mexican rodeo scene. It's very hard to find information on it. Um, but I think because my Google's in English, basically, so it assumes I'm not trying to find it. But I like really want to insert myself in and go to one of these. Um, my Spanish is not where it needs to be. Yeah, yet. but you got to put on the hat. Yeah, but he owns the whole getup. He was showing me photos of his stuff. He um, and then just on the job sites, he of course just wears like jeans and a t-shirt. But he's the biggest belt buckle you've ever seen. He doesn't wear cowboy style boots. I know a few guys who wear steel toe steel toe cowboy boots. Um, they sound nice because you can slip them on and off easily. I mean, I wear like. Blundstone esque boots for that reason, but yeah, I really want to go to a rodeo. It sounds like a blast. I'm sure there's lots of good fried food there too. Um, yeah, corn dogs. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for coming this week, Cone. Uh, yeah. This might be a pretty long episode. We might finally break two hours, mm-hmm. um, but this was a lot of fun. I could tell you were like inspired by some of the things we were exploring. Um, so let us know if like anything we talked about this episode does inform some of the pieces that you come out with in the future. Cause if it does, mm. I'm sure it'll be cool and we love to see it. Yeah. Everyone uh, go visit Cone Ranger in Avondale. Yeah. Um, pop in. You guys are open from what days? We are open Wednesday through Sunday, mm-hmm. uh, Wednesday through Friday, 11 to seven weekends, 11 to five. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Go try on those chaps. Yeah. <laughs> while we still got them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Bye everyone. Thanks for listening. <laughs>